if nothing else, I was prescient in selecting my course topic, unfortunately. But um, the, I, I want to just start off by saying that I think that it's, it's, hard to, it's hard not to be repetitious. I will at least try to be brief and fast. Um, the, but I want to start a little bit earlier than Viet did, talk a little bit about how we got to where we are, because a lot of the analogies that, that he's drawing come from uh, cases and consideration in, in, in policy that's uh, been developed over the course of, of uh, many, many years. Uh, the media, I think, has sort of posed the question, are we going to give up our civil liberties uh, in order to strengthen security, or are we going to preserve our civil liberties and risk further devastating attacks? I firmly believe that's a false choice, that there is a middle ground here, that there is an opportunity to strengthen the authorities that law enforcement has in the current regime, uh, which need updating, and at the same time uh, preserve the, the constitutional pr principles and the civil liberties that we have and that are maintained in current law. And I would argue that over the course at least of the last 30 years, the Congress has been quite able to get that right and get that done. Um, I said I want to start a little bit earlier. Uh, I want to go all the way back to 1928. Uh, there's a famous case called Katz versus the United States when the Supreme Court first considered whether wiretapping uh, itself uh, was a search for application of the Fourth Amendment. And uh, the Supreme Court, in my view, got it wrong in a 5 to 4 decision uh, and, and ruled that there was no entry, uh, that, that putting those little alligator clips on the wire didn't constitute uh, a search for the purposes of the Fourth Amendment, and therefore the person who was being wiretapped uh, had no protection under the, un, under the act. Louis Brandeis, in, a, in, a, in probably the most famous privacy, uh, argued that there would come a time when, uh, when the means of surveillance would reach inside the house, would be able to see uh, what we were doing, they'd be able to look in the drawers, see your papers, etc., uh, and uh, argued forcefully for constitutional protection of privacy, including the contents of a communication that was taking place over what was then a relatively new technology of telephony. Third, maybe 20, 30 years old at the time. Um, fast forward up to 1967, the Supreme Court reverses that in a case called Katz versus the United States, uh, and in a companion case, which Jerry will correct me if I'm wrong, but it's Berger versus New York, uh, I think, in which the Supreme Court sort of threw open the notion, first of all, they, accept, they accepted Brandeis's conclusion that you did have an expectation of privacy, even when you were talking in a phone booth open to the public that that was a private communication that was within the scope uh, of Fourth Amendment protection. And uh, they actually threw open the question of whether there was any way you could meet the constitutional requirement that you could capture with particularity through a warrant process the communications, that you could describe the communication and be able to capture it, uh, as I said, with particularity. Or was a wiretap inherently sort of a general warrant that had been prohibited under the Fourth Amendment. And that's really what led to the passage of Title III. And that's, it's important to understand that because there are a lot of bells and whistles in Title III. Unlike getting a regular warrant under the federal rules of criminal procedure, it's harder to get a Title III warrant. It requires, it applies only to a certain set of crimes. It requires high level Justice Department approval. There's a double uh, exclusionary rule, if you will. There's the Fourth Amendment exclusionary rule, but there's also a statutory exclusionary rule. And Congress did that. They put those belts and suspenders on, in part, I think, because of concerns about, uh, about uh, invasions of privacy and the use of, of, of broad-based wiretapping, what it would do it to our society, but also in part to create a legal regime that met uh, the Fourth Amendment standard. Um, Fast forward to 1978, after the, uh, the Congress takes a look, hard look, at intelligence abuses, intelligence abuses in the United States, intelligence agencies doing surveillance aimed at US citizens in the United States, some of which you know are quite infamous. Uh, they passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Again, and I'm not gonna talk about Jim, I think he's gonna talk more about that, but again, to try to create a framework uh, for how that kind of surveillance gets conducted in, a, in, a, in an arena in which there's more authority, if you will, to be directed by the president to go after agents of a foreign power or a foreign power itself. 
and from this perspective, ter international terrorist groups are foreign powers for purposes of that act. In 1986, some of us in the room uh, ended up taking a look at the new technologies that were coming online. Email was sort of an intranet, intranet based system, sort of a company based system. There weren't a lot of uh, people were just beginning to use it, but it was mostly in that context. There were a few public services, people were operating off of bulletin boards. <coughs> Cell phones were in, numbered in the millions in this country. Uh, and the Congress updated the law and passed the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which again provided the balance, I think, that you ought to be striving for now. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the changes that, that they've made. And then later in the 90s, with, with, with uh, Jim here working on the House Judiciary Committee, Congress, <coughs> Congress passed CALEA, which attempts I say that advisedly, attempts to get at least the traditional common carrier telephone networks to cooperate in the design of the systems to make surveillance a little bit easier for law enforcement at a time when the technology was racing rapidly ahead. Um, through, that, through that course, I think that the balance that the members talked about and that, that we're talking about, Congress found the right, the right basis by coming up to some extent with the, the kind of right kind of analogies. Um, now there's some new proposals on the table. One of my favorite uh, is that, that it is to change the standard with, res with regard to the Cable Act. Um, it's uh, the Cable Act, under the current Cable Act, where there's, even where there's clear proof of a serious crime, law enforcement cannot gain access to subscriber records unless the customer can first contest that in court. Well, if you're the target of surveillance by the, by the uh, in a, an organized crime investigation, drug investigation, in a terrorism investigation, if you, have, if you have the opportunity to go to court to contest the surveillance, you're likely not to use that means of communication in the future. Um, that's an anomaly in the law. The Cable Act was passed in 1984. There was no such thing as a cable modem. People didn't access the internet using a, using a cable system. Now we've got the uh, anomaly that, the, that if you're, you have greater protection if you're using a cable modem than a telephone modem. Uh, if, you're, if you're either a private citizen seeking their privacy or you're someone trying to commit a crime. That is crazy. And that ought to be, I think, fixed and changed. It may be that the courts will change it on their own, but there's no reason why, why that anomaly ought to remain in, uh, in the law. Uh, I've yet mentioned trap and trace devices. Uh, I, I, I part company a little with him on, uh, in that basis. Again, it depends sort of, is, this, is the information you're collecting more like a telephone number or is it more like content or is it someplace in between? My view is that it's, it's a little bit in between, and Congress actually dealt with that again in 1986 when, when they passed uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Uh, they said in that act that it, this isn't exactly like a telephone number. It's a little bit more intrusive when you're collecting information about electronic communications, when you're collecting essentially that to and from line. So in that statute, where the communications have already occurred and are stored, uh, by a service provider. They provide a, a mid-grade level of protection. You don't need probable cause. You don't need a full-blown Title III order. There are only a, a few hundred of those uh, that are actually given each year to, to the department, maybe a few hundred more to state and local authorities. But you do have court supervision, which is unlike what the Justice Department has currently proposed. And you have a slightly higher standard in order to be able to get a access to the, that kind of information, which I would argue falls sort of in a mid, in a mid zone there. Uh, and to answer Congressman Boucher's question, what, where do we go with this? I think if you look, rather than at the pen register title, if you look at 2703D, uh, you'll find a standard that I think might be workable in, the, in, in this area uh, and, and would work, uh, um, uh, to, to, again, to find the right balance. Um, I'm not going to talk about FISA because, because uh, others are. There's another proposal that I think is, is, is I, I think, still in the bill that deals with computer trespass, which permits the authorization uh, if, if for, I'm, I'm see, I got my time, so I'm oh, going no, no, no. to be, be quite brief on this, and then I want to talk, I'm going to step my 
foot into the hot water of encryption for a second. Uh, <laughs> Stay out of there, man. The, uh, I'm not in it. <laughs> <laughs> the, Just don't go there. <laughs> On, on the issue of computer trespass, what, what, they, what they're asking for, what the Justice Department is asking for, is when a, a service provider, an ISP, et cetera, finds that the system's being used by someone not authorized to use the system, that they can allow an agent, an FBI agent, et cetera, to come in and monitor that traffic without having to go to, uh, to a court and get any kind of order or having any kind of court supervision. Um, the way I actually read the statute, it's still, because they've amended the Title III, the wiretap part of the statute, it, in order to give that authority, the, if they're wrong about whether that person actually is a trespasser, if they're a legitimate user, I think the statutory exclusionary rule applies. So one might argue there's, this isn't a particularly big deal uh, because it would not be used very often without court supervision because the chances of getting it wrong have draconian consequences to the investigation. So that's sort of on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, this is, a, I, I would think, a, quite a big loophole uh, in, the, in, the, in the basic scheme of having someone outside the investigative chain, a federal magistrate or a federal judge, at least take a, a second quiet look to see what's going on. And I think you should, the Congress should be extremely cautious in, in, in this regard. It seems to me, again, that, that from a practical perspective, this may not be as big a deal as I think some of the people who are, who are concerned about it. Uh, but I think it, it, it is really a break with what, what, with what the tradition is. And if, if Congress is going to do it, boy, this is, seems to me to be one that is, uh, has a high, um, uh, argument for having a sunset on it because I think it could be very very tricky to implement uh, and it could be actually a pr it just as much of a problem for the for the department let me I'm gonna say one thing about encryption only one thing I basically agree with Congressman Goodlatte which is that I think the proposals f that are at least have surfaced on the Senate side by by Congressman Gregg to require mandatory key escrow uh, won't work the genie's out of the bottle, the car's out of the barn, whatever analogy you want to use, the, the, it, it's gone. And I think there are serious security consequences, as he suggested, uh, to, to require mandatory key escrow encryption or backdoors in, in all the encryption products. Having said that, I don't know how many of you use encrypted communications. I would guess maybe we have a show of hands. I mean, it, it, it would regularly encrypt your email. My prediction is that that because encryption inherently, while it's getting easier to use, is still hard to use. It's going to be more and more provided through networks, as Congressman Goodlatte described, through security uh, companies, through banking facilities, through ISPs, through AOL uh, Time Warner, through Microsoft, through its XO system. Security tools are going to be built in on the, into the network and be provided by third-party providers, not by the person downloading PGP off the, off the uh, internet and, and creating uh, encrypted sessions with their buddies. More and more security tools are going to be held outside of your personal computer by third parties. More personal information is going to be held in Redmond, Washington. And we do not have a coherent statutory scheme for law enforcement to access those security tools and I think just as importantly from a privacy perspective, to know what the standard is that courts should apply, how long you can keep them if you get them, and what you should do with them when you're done with them. Uh, and I think that's something that Congress ultimately is going to have to grapple with. But the boogeyman about saying the word encryption is so strong that I think it's, it's hard to even have uh, a reasonable debate about that question. I'll turn it over to Jim. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist is uh, James Dempsey from the Senate Deputy Director of the Center for